Hi there. Uh, so, change of plans. Like it turns out, this this um, slot is after lunch, but before coffee, so we're gonna be all asleep. So it'd be too boring for us to talk about Python. So instead, we're gonna be doing like a piano competition between those people here. Um, no, like there, there's gonna be a core dev panel. Uh, I'm Mukash. I'm the core developer in residence, also called the uh, janitor of the core team, uh, which is why I'm just talking, asking questions. They're gonna be answering. Uh, we have with us Ma um, Steve Dower, Mark Shannon, Pablo Galino Salgado, Batu Hantaskaya, Ken Jin, and Erit Catriel. Um, the thing is this, like, I would like you to be involved in this panel. We're not going to talk amongst each other. What I would like you to do is just ask questions, which you can do here. And if you're watching this remotely, where's the camera here? Uh, you can also ask questions, so do. Um, and if you do, like, we're going to pass them on to the team so they can answer. Um, and before you start lining up, like, let me just warm up the thing by just asking a question to everybody here. Uh, hi. Can you tell us something about yourself and the area of Python that you are uh, well responsible for? Sure. Uh, my name's Steve Dower. I'm originally from Australia, but I live in Scotland these days because it's so awesome there, and I love it. Um, within Python, I mostly focus on Windows-related things, and I'm also really um, tr yeah, trying, to trying to spend more time caring for the security side of things and also embedding. Okay, I'm Mark Shannon. I live in the UK. I was born in the UK as well, so I haven't really moved very far at all. Uh, I'm the tech lead of the Faster C Python team, so making Python faster. Uh, I'm Pablo Alindo. Uh, I come from Spain. I uh, live in the UK now. I'm a release manager of 310, 3.11. I'm also in the Steam Council for um, these past two years, and I work mainly on the parser and the GC, and a bit of the compiler as well. Yeah, my name is Batuan. I come from the southern part of the Turkey. Uh, I mainly work on the parser and the Python compiler, as well as some other libraries like ASD and Tokenize and such. Hi, I'm Ken. Um, I, I'm from Singapore, and I work on typing, and I also help make Python faster. Hi, I'm Irit Kotrell. I'm based in London. I, um, I, I work on an interpreter. I, I implemented exception groups and accept star for 3.11, and then worked on a number of other projects related to exceptions. And uh, recently, in, I joined the uh, Faster C Python team in Microsoft, so I'm working with Mark Shannon a lot. All right, cool. Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, the mic is there if you do ha uh, have questions to ask us. Uh, if you don't, so far. Um, I do have one for you. Like, do you remember your first contribution and when you started contributing to Python? Oh, my first contribution. Uh, I remember my first bug report because uh, just because it got fixed so quickly by, by this guy named Benjamin Peterson. Uh, and it was years and years ago, which probably meant he was about six at the time, I think. But it was definitely him that fixed it. But I, I was just really impressed with like, a project that, that I had downloaded and was using for free. I was, you know, and found something that didn't quite work. I posted the details, and about six hours later, the, this person, who I didn't know at that point, it's like it was just a name came up and said, yeah, this is fixed. And eventually I met him years later, and I'm like, aren't you still in high school? Yeah, yeah, he was. But I think my first, first contribution, uh, I came into this weird, because I kind of came in like, I, I, you know, I already work at Microsoft, I already know Windows well, can I help with the installer? And about, Two days after I kind of suggested that, the person who maintained the installer at that point said, I, I need to step back from this. And so everyone kind of found me again and was like, yes, the job's yours. Go for it. Um, and yeah, the rest is, rest is a lot of work. I mean, history. rest is history. Mark? Uh, I don't actually remember my first contribution, but I do remember my first bug report, like Steve. Uh, I think it was to do with addition. Now, in Python, the way addition works is you get the dunder add and then there's a dunder r add, and I remember there was something wrong with that, but I can't remember what, the, what actually it was. I think it was Mark Dickinson fixed it, and again, I was impressed with how fast it was fixed. Uh, first contribution, I actually looked this up recently, and I've forgotten again. <laughs> Me memory leaks. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> Pablo? I think my first contribution was some, some documentation thing. But I, I was checking the other day, and I think I have the 
dubious honor to be the core developer that broke all the billboards uh, in the least amount of PRs. My, <laughs> my, my third, my third commit merchant on C Python broke everything, and my fourth fixed everything. So you know, <laughs> it's fine. That one. Oh uh, yeah, I made like a couple feature suggestions before I started contributing. I never like you know made that suggestions a reality because they were like dumb stuff. But my first contribution was something around lib 223, which is not deprecated, but I made some like tiny change in there. Ken? Um, my first contribution was in um, Pickle, but that PR was never merged even till today. So I kind of gave up <laughs> on that. I gave up on that part of CPython. Um, I later found um, an undocumented part of CPython that people wanted documentation being, um, wanted someone to write documentation for. So I'm not sure you've heard about it. It's PEP604, union type syntax. Um, basically means in typing, you can have a union by saying typing.union, um, then the types. In 3.10, you can say um, the type, then have the pipe operator to say you want to create a union. And I wrote the documentation for that as my actual first contribution. Eric? Um, my f the first time I checked out the Python source code, I was working at Bank of America, and I was maintaining a, we had a system that, um, a huge system written in Python with extensions and so on. We were upgrading it from 3.7 to 3.8, and one of our unit tests sig faulted. And when I looked at that test, there was a comment there saying that that test tests are some bug that existed in Python 2.6. So that, that, that's some case that used to crash in 2.6, and 3.8 it was crashing as well, and we had a test in the C Python um, test suite didn't, so I, I reported that, that there's been a regression there. And the, the, so I, I got a, a, a checkout to kind of git bisect and find out which commit it was, and it was a change in, in the garbage collector's trash can mechanism that brought back an old, an old bug. If you have a, a very, very long linked list and then you kind of decrypt the first item, then the whole list needs to be decrypted. So there's something that makes sure that the garbage collector doesn't recurse too deeply, and there was a bug there. All right, uh, so now let's start answers from the other side of the, chair, uh, of the table. Uh, so like back then, like did you already think about like oh like I'm gonna be contributing more than just w this one thing or like you know like how did it how did it pass that you're a core developer now? How did it happen? So Eric. Oh me. Yes, let's start uh, from this uh, oh, this end I, of the table. I, I I was I was just trying to get us on three eight, um, and then actually my manager at the time said, you know what. You know, you, you got in touch, you, you're talking to them, so why don't you spend a day a week working on Python? It, this was during lockdown. We were working at home, and it was all fine. Um, and uh, so he said a day a week. He didn't say which day. Every day's a day. You know, it, it's very confusing in lockdown. It's like, you know, Groundhog Day. So every day, I, kind of, I, I think it's my Python day. <laughs> and um, long story short, I work for Microsoft full-time working on Python. Um, yeah. Cool. Ken. Um, yeah, so at the start, um, because I was working on typing, um, I was noticed by Guido, and he decided to start mentoring me. Later on, I decided to branch out to other areas of CPython, and fortunately enough, um, Pablo started mentoring me also. So that's how I eventually became a core developer. Yeah, what one? So I was like really enjoying playing with Python internals, you know, at that time. And then I started sending a few PRs to lib 23 ASD, and that sort of stuff. It, it, it went very slowly. And, you know, I was doing like very low amount of PRs, you know, just baking stuff up for myself or just checking up the bug tracker. And one day I see like an email in Python dev from Pablo on AST on parse. You know, I'm going to add this. What do you think? And I sent him an email. OK, can, can we work this on? Like, can we work together on this? And he said yes. And then we start like an, uh, we, we had like an informal mentorship, which evolved to uh, like a formal mentorship. And that led me to become a core developer. Thanks, Pablo. Cool. Pablo. 
I, I say after I reached the pinnacle of my career, breaking everything, I say, wow, breaking things is cool. <laughs> 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 How many things I can break? Um, I, th I think actually at that time, uh, like when, when actually I broke everything, I, I was talking with Victor Steiner, he's another core developer, um, and he actually says, uh, you, you are good at breaking things, what about if I mentor you to not do that? And, and then I say, oh, that would be very good. And you know, he's French, I know he's Spaniard, so we, apparently we, we, we go together. Um, and yeah, it's been, a, been a, quite a ride. Yeah. Mark? Uh, well, I was working on, I actually did a PhD in um, implementation of virtual machines for dynamic languages. So working on C Python or Ruby or something kind of was a, a natural follow on. Uh, and Python was just the best choice. Uh, it's the best language. And it's also most interesting and challenging to optimize. So all around the best option. Well, cool. Steve. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I had this this wild idea that I could make one contribution and, and improve something, and then walk away, and, and it would just be better. Um, and it turns out that no, you're not allowed to walk away. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's it's yours, and and there's always more ways to keep making making things better. So I, you know, I didn't intend to to kind of find a full time commitment, but but I found it, and as long as there's more to do, then I'm you know I'm in. Yeah. Very cool. We have a question from the audience. Hi, I'm Jolt. Um, let me turn the heat up a little bit and ask this question. Uh, so what do you think of auto formatters and when and if the C Python? So can, can I break them? <laughs> of course you can. I actually did. Okay. He, he knows it. Yeah? Yeah. Go ahead. But, I mean, I, I don't want to answer the question necessarily. Oh, you already no, started. So how, can, can, how much hate can I take on? Oh, a lot. <laughs> Look at the room. Yeah. Do you like black? I break it. Yeah. <laughs> there are some fans. I nice. Guess. Uh, it's true. Like uh, I mean, out of the joke. Like when we, um, like when when uh, Lisandros, uh, Guido, and myself wrote the new pack parser. Uh, one unintended consequence is that we break black because the technology that Black was using and many other tools was based on the old parser and in the new parser we can do all these funky things. Um, and uh, yeah, but then uh, Batuhan found how to do a bunch of hacks and now Black survives with lollipop sticks and glue. And <laughs> yeah, at, at least until 3.12. Right, and then right. we'll see what you come up with. More, more lollipop sticks. <laughs> but it works, I mean. Who cares how, how, how it works, right? So Pablo broke a, an auto formatter. Like anybody here that like, you know, has strong opinions on auto formatters besides me? I, I love having a formatter that doesn't lead. So, so with, within Microsoft where I work, I, I spend a lot of time trying to help a lot of teams successfully use Python. And for a long time, the first question they were all like, which rules in, in you know, other linters should I enable to help us get our style right? And it's, it's actually really nice to just be able to say, just use black. And, and like all of these arguments and debates just no longer exist. And I'm not stuck maintaining like a 300 page long style guide. So I, I like it from that point of view. Any counter argument, Batuhan? Uh, not, not a counter argument, but like I was going to give an example. Uh, so when I like write like, I don't know, something bigger than like hundreds lines of code in C Python, I just put it to another file, format it with black, and then paste it back. I don't know, <laughs> because it is the easier way and it looks good. So I, I personally would love to have black, but you know, there are a lot of other challenges. So yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, so sorry, Joel, like bad audience for, for actually turning the heat on, on this particular question. But we have another question, so, so another try. I was actually wondering if you would be discussing black for C code given that most of Python or C Python is written in C. But my question is, nevertheless, so first and foremost, thank you for your contributions. Uh, I'm thinking about getting out of the Python ecosystem and the packaging problem, let's say, uh, and say embedding. And that's, uh, in the industry, a solved problem with containers on the server side, let's say. We can solve it easily. When we talk about deploying a Python application to common users, on the desktop or mobile, you'll be talking about that tomorrow. Uh, the challenge is, I think, is still open. Um, and nowadays, if I'm not mistaken, we are distributing uh, an embeddable uh, 
C Python distribution for Windows only. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it does not include the standard library, so it requires some effort from packagers. Uh, what about Mac? Uh, what about Linux? I know these are different technical challenges. They're more like building and linking challenges and packaging issues more than the core language, but they're as important uh, as the language itself if we can't deploy uh, software to end users. And of course, the future is mobile, so the question stands. So how can we reach a, a deployable, embeddable, out of the Python ecosystem because end users don't care uh, the, about the technology that the software is built on, okay? Anybody wants to take this? Um, well, I mean, the WebAssembly work is kind of key here, I think. Uh, especially for if it's mainly UI stuff, then, you know, we're walking at human speed and the, the performance hit you get from the WebAssembly translation is, is not really an issue. And then you just bundle it with, the, you know, like any, as you'd bundle a JavaScript app for the, for the device. Uh, if performance is an issue, though, then, then yeah, those are problems. Yeah, I mean, as, as the person who put together the embeddable distro for Windows, it was possible because of the way Windows does its binaries and, and does kind of uh, how it finds the, the other binaries at runtime, and it's a system that just doesn't transfer to Mac and Linux. So, so yeah, I did it for Windows because that's my area, and it was easy, and I knew how to do it, and I kind of said, well, you know, the, the Mac and Linux experts can figure it out over there, and, and some people have, some people have. So the, there's a project out there that's, um, was it Static Python or Python Static Builds or something? There's, there's a couple of attempts out there to make relocatable Python builds. The challenge is it's not just in Python at that point. It's pulling in more dependencies, and you get a bigger thing. But there's, there's definitely work going on for that. Um, but yeah, as, as Mark says, I think the, the WebAssembly and the fact that that largely runs on already designed to be portable uh, machines means we can kind of once go through CPython and say, well, guess what? Subprocess is no longer available everywhere because we support WebAssembly now, so you can't assume that you can start another process and run it. And once we actually go through and do that cleanup, then it becomes a lot easier to, to make kind of the more core pieces more portable because if you've ever tried to write code that launches a subprocess that does spawn or exec across all three platforms, you've failed. Uh, if you have succeeded, come and find me, but, but you, you know, probably not. <laughs> I think one of the other challenges that, that you will find and is quite, like we are absorbing it into CPython because like, okay, it's Python, but like compared to other languages that should have this support, like Lua, for instance, is, is one of the mm -hmm. examples that people bring, like look, it's, it's super easy to embed. Like CPython is playing very much deeper into the ecosystems. For instance, uh, share, like C extensions are shared objects, and now you have to play with the rules of L files in Linux, and Mac OS, uh, Mac OS files, and whatever Windows does. And the thing is that th those have much bigger constraints. Like for instance, you cannot just load a shared object from, a fi from the same file. So you will never be able to have, at least in vanilla, libc, Linux, a single file that is your application. That is what a lot of people will want because you cannot just say, oh, my extensions live inside myself and I will load from memory, right? That, that cannot be done. Um, like Google does this, but because they fork libc and they have their own funky, um, you know, deal open from memory, or whatever. Uh, but normally you cannot do that, right, in a portable version. And this is just a consequence that we just expose more stuff and we are much more flexible. So, um, and, and I think the other the application that you were mentioning is PyInstaller and Beware has some briefcase thing. Yeah, be, be, Beware has, has some tooling for it. Um, the, there's definitely, because it's on Gregory, um, Gregory Sork, that's it, has, has the, the project. I mean, they, they um, work br like relatively well, I think. They, they, they do work well, but it requires kind of owning your entire application stack. You take responsibility for a lot more. Um, I, I would definitely say if that's an area that you're interested in making work well across platforms, check out Blender, check out OBS Studio, because they do this already, and they are multi-platform uh, to varying extents uh, you know, in the feature set. But people can do it, but it is considerably more work than, than simply saying, you must have already installed Python so we can use right. it. All right, thanks. Another question from the audience, please. Hi, my name is Pavel. Um, do you think Python is going in the right direction 
in terms of like new features being added, and regardless of that, what should be the direction for Python? Who wants to take this? <laughs> Steering council member. I mean, it would be weird if I say no, right? <laughs> I mean, I think it's going in the right direction in the sense that you need to understand there is no A direction because Python right now being one of the most popular languages by certain ways of looking at this has a super different use base, right? And what you may think is, is important and nice and small and super my language fits in my head or whatever, like you may have like another big user group that doesn't think like that, right? Like for instance, the people that are very excited about typing normally don't play well with the people that are teaching Python because like, you know, they, they normally look at types and say, oh, why is this, right? But it turns out that um, those people then go to other places and then they change their views and now they think like, and typing is just an example here, that it's awesome and they want to learn it, right? So, so there is many different user groups and there is many different needs. And, um, and for us, we cannot just say, oh, the direction is this one and this is the one that we're going to follow. Like we need to take into account every time we take decisions that normally affect the whole language, all everyone, and it's always a difficult balance. And the thing about balances and compromises is that there is nothing that is going to make purely one user group happy. Because as you know, like this time we reject this super complicated typing feature, so all the people that think that we have too much syntax are happy, but then the next day we accept something else uh, because it's very useful for the people, like for instance, section groups, right? Because it's going to be super useful for people using AsyncIO. And it's normal that if you don't do AsyncIO, you say like, oh wow, this is insane. Like why will anybody complicate the language? Now I need to learn about all these many things. But um, so, so this will happen with like big languages. And Python has 30, it's a 30 year old language, right? So like we, we are accumulating a lot of this. Um, so yes, I, I personally think we are doing, at least we're not doing a horrendous job, and, um, and uh, the, the key here is that we don't look at a direction, we look at our community and our use base, and then we try to do our best for the future of the language, not only of the implementation. Um. All right, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, the ideal Python is one that has all the features you need and none of the features you don't. But, um, and consequently, you know, whether a new feature is accepted depend, is good, it depends on whether you want it or not. Uh, but it, it's kind of hard just to, I mean, you kind of want a sort of coherent vision of where the language was going, but unless you're omniscient, that isn't going to happen. So it's kind of a, you know, many minds is the best approximation to sort of a perfect mind. So yeah, there's sort of, you know, community sort of decisions and so on. I mean, I mean, my worry is that features are accepted or rejected to a certain degree and sort of like who shouts the loudest. Um, so I think probably having more, you know, if, even if you'd sort of, like you have an interest in Python, which I assume you do, otherwise you wouldn't be here. You know, if there's a, a pep and you think about it, it's like, well, I don't like that for a reason or I do like it or whatever. I mean, you know, say something. So at least you sort of like stand up and be counted. Cool. Thanks. Before we move on to another of those questions, like, do we have any from the remotes? Okay, no. Uh, carry on, please. So I think it's pretty well established by now we won't be seeing a Python 4.0 anytime soon. But if you had the choice, where would you like to horrendously break backwards in compatibility? Where do we don't want to break backwards? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Everywhere, all at once. Because if, like, Python 4 is such a drastic thing, we're not even imagining it. And, you know, if it was, then it would be such a new thing that, like, only the pure Python code would survive because, like, we're never going to do it. And it would have to be, like, world ending to do it. And so everything just gets destroyed. We rewrite in Rust, probably. <laughs> Eric, do you have an opinion? Or what, do you want, what would you want to break in Python if you could? Um, yeah, personally, um, I would like the guild to be gone, and I think that's a pretty um, common request. But I'm not, I don't think that will warrant a 4.0. I think it depends on what, how we approach that problem. All right. Um, well, I, yeah, there are the big things like the guild and, and the, the things that we all know, but from the point of view of someone who worked intensively on exceptions, um, for about a year, 
there, there are a number of things in exception chaining that are not, there are some edge cases that I, I would iron out. I would change that mechanism in a way that is probably very hard to do now. Um, and um, I, th I think there are a few issues around scoping of variables that are a bit weird that, that I would tidy up. All right, now we have another question. Hi. Um, speaking of new features, um, some other languages have the concept of null coalescing and no, no aware operators. There have been some attempts at apps uh, for Python for non aware operators. What are your views on that? Because personally, I would really like to see them. I really like them in other languages. Steve, Steve, Steve. Yeah, Steve. yeah I mean, I, I, I withdrew the pep that I wrote on that. Um, so I'd like to hear other people's opinions before I explain my reasoning. I don't have a strong opinion on this matter. So, so for people who aren't familiar with that, the, the idea, you may have seen it, uh, I believe it was added to JavaScript recently. It's been in C Sharp for a while. But essentially, if you have a variable and you're gonna do like variable dot attribute, then you need to do a none check first. You need to say, if this is none, I don't wanna do that attribute because I know it's just gonna fail. And so the idea is you have a special operator, a question mark dot, where if the value is, I'll say if the value is none, but that was a point of contention. If the value is none, then don't bother looking up the attribute, just, re just return none, essentially. So it's like, if the, if the value is none, give me none. If it's not none, look up this attribute. And what it lets you do is, is it lets you create like long chains of um, lo like looking up attributes on attributes on attributes on attributes without having to have this really long chain of is this one none, is this one none, is this one none, is this one none. And so you can get, in, in that situation, you can get kind of a, a nice single line expression that handles all of that. The coalescing operator is a question mark, question mark, typically, that says if the value on this side is none, give me the value on this side. Uh, in Python, we often use the or operator for that, which says if this value is false or looks false, give me the value on this side. Uh, and that was also an interesting discussion because none looks false. So if you have none or some other value, you'll get the other value. Um, the reason I eventually kind of withdrew that is I had a, I had a real interesting discussion with Raymond Hettinger um, at one of our core dev sprints where, where he basically laid out, it's like, but the features that go into the language actually change the way people program. And it has far more of a flow and effect than just how that particular thing gets written. It's going to affect how the rest of the code is written. So for example, right now, if you're gonna append a value into a list, you may check that it's, you're not appending none. And you'll say, if I have a good value, I'll put it in the list. But if you know that when you go to get values out of the list, you're going to non-coalesce everything, you're not gonna be worried about that. And so you'll happily throw you know, garbage values into a list, and then they get carried around, passed around, and, and show up all over the place, and they may get serialized and pickled and, and all sorts of stuff, because when you come to use it, that's when you know you're gonna handle it. And, and basically, you know, I had this conversation, I thought about it some more, and I'm like, I don't wanna encourage that kind of coding in Python. I don't think that, uh, like, like, I think being able to trust the value that you have been given, wherever it came from, is kind of a core part of Python, and we don't defensively double check everything before we use it, because we, we have kind of the, the code laid out in a way that, you know, we, we check it when we first get it, and then use it, and that gives us nice kind of straight line readable code that doesn't have conditions and checks and exception handling all over the place, apart from a few specific things we know about. So I didn't like the idea of, if I get this feature in, everyone's gonna start putting nuns in lists everywhere, and you know, instead of one, two, three, we'll have one, none, 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 two, none, 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 three, because that, yeah. So I didn't like the, the implication of what, what coding might turn into with that feature there. So t 10 years back, I had like a lightning talk at EuroPython, it was in, in Florence at the, that year, uh, about how I regret nothing, and you cannot judge me, like, with like bad examples of bad things I did with Python, one of which was implementing the null pattern, which is kind of non-coalescing, uh, but like going further, so like replacing uh, dictionaries with null dictionaries that also mm -hmm. allow you to like, you know, find keys that are not there without raising exceptions and so on and so on. So I just like did my lightning talk, it had memes in it, so it, people laughed, you know, we left Florence, and now 10 years later, this null package that still is on PyPI gets like some scary number of downloads. 
meaning yeah. like somebody is using it. <laughs> so yes, like Hiram's law, like every observable um, part of like, you know, a system is going to be depended by somebody. So uh, we have to be careful about what we add because we can never remove it uh, uh, afterwards. If Unless I can, if I can add on another recommendation like that, that as well. Yeah. Don't, don't use his package. Uh, but, but there is, so there are match statements now, which I believe will handle this properly where if it has, you know, if one attribute is none and you're trying to match longer than that, then it's just going to say it doesn't match and it won't be an error. So match statement is a, is a good way to do this, I believe. I haven't tested that one. Uh, but there's also a package out there called Glom, which effectively lets you write the lookup pattern as a string. It's, you know, imagine that it's like regular expressions but yourself. for navigating object hierarchies. That's a really neat way to do it because that lets you have, you know, all the control to say, look up this expression you know, and its attributes and indices and parameterized and, and all of that cool stuff, but handle it in this way if this bit hasn't worked out. So that's a neat way to kind of compress all of you know, what might be 30 lines of ifs and, and accept key errors and everything to make that ni you know, nicer to use. Cool. Anthony has a question. Um, will we see a JIT in C Python? Uh, and if we will, what would it look like and what would the boundaries be? Uh, Anthony wrote a JIT for a no, I'm not. I'm not selling mine. I'm pip, stopping pip, working Pip install pigeon? <laughs> Is that? <laughs> Mark? Eric, uh, what was the question? <laughs> I, I didn't get the question. Will there be a JIT for Python and how will it look like? In C Python. C Python, yes. Will there be? A JIT. A JIT. Oh, oh Mark, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, <laughs> keep going. so, uh, if JIT is a general magical term for makes it go faster, then we've already got one, because it's already faster. Um, <laughs> if you mean specifically, do we have something that translates uh, something, the bytecode into machine code at runtime? Uh, probably 3.13, maybe 3.14. How would it look like? Like, how, how will it be different It'll from what you're like doing It'll look like a big it? pile of C code. <laughs> um, <laughs> How will it look? How long have we got? Uh, we, we've got half an hour. Okay. Right. So, <laughs> so there are two types conventionally of just in time compilers. Uh, one is tracing, which is what PyPy does, and the other is method of time, which is what the JVM does, and a whole bunch of other examples. Um, Pigeon and Cinder and Piston are all method at a time jets. Um, PyPy is a tracing jet. Basically, the difference is tracing and method at a time is what region of code you choose to compile as a single unit. Uh, PyPy looks for um, loops, although it can handle cases where it can't find one, um, and tries to compile basically just the loop. And that will inline some function calls within it. Uh, the method time just compile the whole function. Um, neither are ideal, um, but the problem with any sort of dynamic optimization is you need to do it quickly, and you need to do it only knowing the past. You can't know the future, obviously. Mm -hmm. So you have to make guesses as to what sort of are good regions to compile. Um, there is approaches that use smaller regions, basic blocks, which are basically just a few bytecodes in a row. Uh, HHVM, which is a PHP compiler, Facebook does that. And the YJIT, which is, I think, a Ruby, part of C Ruby um, done by people at Shopify, does what's called basic block versioning, which is just runs a basic block. Which, a basic block is a, a, a unit of code without any branches in it um, at a time. And those are simpler and also sort of promising because uh, they're smaller units of compilation, which means lower pauses, and they're much simpler to handle because there's no flow control issues within the units of code. So we'll probably start with something like that. Um, HHVM also then does, tries to form larger regions of code once it's the the tracelets, which is a small or basic block type units of compilation have sort of got themselves hot. You might try and find a larger more a region which would probably look something like a method with a few inlines. Um, method time, again, you can inline stuff. There's, there's loads of ways of doing it, so we'd probably start simplish. Um, 
Now, because Python is such a dynamic language, most of the, much of the speed up, even for converting to machine code, is actually just removing some of the dynamic stuff and sort of things like what's called guard coalescing, which is if we expect something, so suppose you look up the length of a list. We have to look up the global variable len, and then we, um, then we check that it is, in fact, the len function. And then we check the type as a list, and then we compute the list of it. Um, we can expect a lot of those things. Currently, with the optimizer we have in C Python 3.11, we'll essentially be doing those checks for each bytecode. It's still faster than just not doing the checks at all and having overly general code, but we are doing quite a lot of repetition. As we optimize bigger regions, we can start removing those checks. If you know you're going to have a just-in-time compiler, you can generate a sort of intermediate representation, which is a sort of lower level than bytecode, perform that analysis, remove those checks, and then generate the machine code. But as part of my PhD, what, we, what I did was do that in the bytecode. So actually, you can do those stuff and still interpret the output. And that still gives you a speed up. So that's the sort of next step. So probably something like that will show up in 3.12. Cool. And then depending on how well that works, we push that further, or if, if that shows the potential for the optimization but doesn't give the speed up. And the reason that might happen is that we trade removing one overhead for another, basically because we're lowering the code. We have more overhead of just managing in smaller bytecodes and doing more interpretive stuff, even though we have to do less sort of dynamic lookup. If that works, we'll push that further. If the speed up sort of is non, then that becomes like a, we just keep that as a sort of like a hold, as a, that's our intermediate step for the just-in-time compiler. But either way, yeah, the, we would expect a, a jet in 3.13, 3.14, it's hard to say. But the important thing is being like that the client code, the user code stays the same. You don't have to change your code, right? Like it's yeah, still yeah. Just, just as dyna dynamic yeah. like from the view of it, right? Like as it was before. Yeah, yeah. So, and the, and the so other Mark, thing, that was a yes? Uh, yes, that was a yes. That was a yes. <laughs> I mean, it's important to also understand that the cost of the JIT is not just writing it, it's, 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 just, it's a balance, right? Like, like the JIT normally makes, for instance, startup slow. So it means that if, if you always have the JIT activated, or, I mean, most JITs, right? Um, like, it means that you, you, if you have a command line application, it, it's going to be slow. Like, for instance, PyPy is slower to start than C Python. Uh, PyPy is just slower than CPython. In if you remove the, if you turn off the JIT, PyPy is considerably slower than CPython. It's slower to start because it's just slower. Um, there's no reason why having a JIT. I mean, it bulks out the code, so the interpreter might take a fraction of a millisecond longer to to load. But if you don't use it, it shouldn't really affect the code. I mean, a lot of the like Java applications are deemed to be slow start because the JVM is huge and does take a long time to load. Mm -hmm. But there's also the issue of just perceived slowness. If you're used to it being fast because it's a just-in-time compiler, it will seem slower at startup. And just to be fair to, to PyPy there, they're, they're slower until the JIT kicks in. And when the JIT kicks in, it's right, right, significantly right. faster than it, C5. It's just that it depends on what areas do you care about. Like yeah, you may exactly. not care about that your application will be very fast, but you want your <coughs> command line application to be snappy. Also, debugging is interesting, because like when you have the JIT and then you start debugging your application through a debugger, or you just attach P, uh, like GDB or something like that, you need to either uh, like return the un uncompiled version, or now you need to make sure that your JIT has frame pointers so GDB can backtrace through the, through the compile code. So it's not just the JIT. It's all the machinery around it and making sure that the experience doesn't get worse. All right. If I can add a comment on, on, on the JIT topic, yeah, there are also ahead. like two problems. First of all is that if you start with JIT, you will basically go infinitely deep with it because, well, you can optimize everything until mm. probably and spend infinite amount of money and time on it. That's basically what Chromium did. They like spent uh, really, really millions of dollars on like making Turbo fun. That's their JIT. They have like super fast and like make JS efficient. And you can even go so much deep that you can even like look at the ranges of the values that are being returned from functions. So for example, in JavaScript, if you are doing something like string.index of some character in the string, you know, this can return either the index or a, or a negative value. And the JIT can like know that this function always produces uh, values from minus one to some maximum string length value. And it determines uh, like how this result is then used and like can optimize if conditions. 
Uh, so that's the, the big issue there that the, you can basically go infinite deep with it. And uh, the second thing is like security. Like as you said, you may have also bugs in JIT, and that's the thing that's happening in, in Chromium, for example, and Firefox, and uh, the, the WebKit, the Safari one as well. And uh, if you start with JIT, you will you may end up with some like very uh, hard to de detect issues and uh, hard to debug as well, because well, JIT code is not necessarily easy to debug. So if so, maybe that's my, my small request. If you go with the JIT approach, maybe try, maybe at least think about going to Rust with it, because that would probably be uh, at least more secure than using C for it. But yeah, thank you. I guess once you generate machine code, like it doesn't much matter, like whether you generated it with Rust or with C. But like I, I, I see what you're saying, and this is, for example, one reason why Apple just kind of just doesn't allow you to use JIT code like on iOS. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because like. There can be holes in it. We don't know. Do we have any questions from them? Okay. Let's, let's have another from here. Thanks. I was wondering if you could share some ideas of uh, the faster C Python project that you are thinking to explore. Oh, so Besides like, JIT. Mm -hmm. Besides JIT. <laughs> you have a talk on this, right? Yeah, yeah. Come to the talk tomorrow. Ah, okay. yeah. Great, oh, yeah. great. Yeah, thank Although, you. Thank to be you. fair, the talk is kind of mostly about what we've already done rather than what we're going to do, but it does cover what we're going to yeah, do. Yeah, perfect. I yeah. wasn't playing out all the mm. conference already, so thanks. That's good then. Yeah, yeah. If we do still have talks, like for, for those of us who didn't have one yet, like come to our talks, yes. <laughs> You'll learn stuff. Like uh, mine is on iOS, yeah. Let's have another question. Uh, core developers are also humans. Uh, controversial opinion. Uh, <laughs> which aspect of your work with Python fills you with joy? Like, what's a good day for you? Let's start from that, that end of the table. Erit. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, wow. It feels <laughs> like I need a really good answer for this. Um, I, for, OK. What, when I started kind of, when I took the role I had at Bank of America and I was looking after a library that about 4,000 people were using, it would blow my mind that I'm writing code that 4,000 people are using. And now I work on Python and I think, when I commit code, I sometimes think, how many times a day will this line of code run? You know, it could be like one or two lines in a, in a pull request. And, and I think and, and that, that totally blows my mind. So it's the impact. Um, when, when I take a step back and think about, you know, the context of what I'm doing. Otherwise, um, uh, you know, it, it, the team is, is, is you know, it's, it's an extremely strong team of, of software engineers, and it's just fantastic to be working with people like that. And there's, there's an incredible amount of collaboration and respect and, and energy that um, I think we're kind of pushing each other forward. Um, Ken, there's a lot of like, uh, well, joy in typing, right? Yeah, can you talk, talk <laughs> something about like what you make, <laughs> what makes you tick? Okay, yeah, so um, kind of like how Irit mentioned about the impact. Um, when I first started on typing, I thought that Meh, this is just something that people use for annotations. Then one day, um, there was a bug in typing that was caused by, I think, me. And suddenly, like, I had 50 messages on that PR like, complaining about the bug, and people from NumPy, Pandas, and other libraries were just like, blasting my inbox. And that was when I realized that, like, oh shit, typing is actually pretty important. And it's used by a lot of people. So, um, like, it's just yeah, pretty mind-blowing that so many people use the code that I write. And the other thing is that um, the typing, sorry, the people behind CPython, so the core team, has actually been quite inviting because I'm actually one of the newest core developers here on this panel. I'm not, I haven't been a core developer for that long. And most of my experience um, has been that people are quite welcoming to me um, on my journey to become a core dev. Anything to add? Anybody else? I, I, I have a story. Uh, yeah, go ahead with your story. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know if everyone had a high point, or do you, do you just know that like, he, does, he doesn't like doing it? Is that 
You, you, uh, I, I just, you don't want Pablo to tell us his high point? No, I just opened up, like, you know, like yeah. anybody okay. that wants to share a story can. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Uh, That's a great like, question. Yeah. As everybody said, you know, the, the impact is just amazing because, you know, the code you wrote is, like, used by hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, I, I, I felt this when I was, like, you know, doing some minor argument parsing improvement on print function. You know, like, the, the print is, like, the core of the language, and, like, I was touching that, and, but it felt amazing. But what, 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 what I really enjoy is seeing people, like, uh, seeing... seeing people like the features that we put so much effort in, like the new error messages that Pablo and I and others are doing. You know, pe people are sharing it. They're saying, oh, this saved us hours and hours of debugging. Okay, th that's like, th that, that's really, uh, that really makes me happy on that end. Um, yeah, if you'd asked me 10 years ago to describe my d dream job, I think it would be basically what I'm doing now. So that's pretty good. Um, but yeah, the impact is just amazing. Yeah, the, the feel that uh, and people, you know, there's you still, you know, widely read stuff, you know, widely viewed talks about, you know, what we're doing. It's just, yeah, that make that feels really good. I think I'm going to go with a cheesy answer and say that actually, I, 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 my favorite part is the interaction with people. Like, you know, I have made very good friends on the core team. Like, we are going to Spain next week. Like, it's, it's quite ridiculous if you think about it because. You normally think that, oh, you know, I'm going to do this thing because the impact and whatnot, and you start like that, but, but it turns out that um, many of my best friends are now in the core team, which is, I think, that's awesome. And that's what gives me uh, um, in, into, into it. Yeah, so a few years back at Europython, um, I was sat, you know, sat down and chatting with a guy, um, and he, you know, he kind of asked, you know, what's, what, what's your, your, what sort of things do you work on? I told him, yeah, I've, I've been you know, helping maintain Python on Windows and, and redoing the install, and he's like, oh, that was you? I'm like, okay, okay, am I about to get in trouble? Yeah, it's 50-50, right? It's like half the time I get in trouble. He's like, okay, listen, I, I do a lot of teaching, and I do a lot of teaching around the world, and particularly in Africa. It's like that's a really important, it's a really important thing to, to, to this guy. And it's like I do a lot of teaching in Africa, and a lot of the students there, the high school students, don't have computers. They don't, they don't have access to computers. The schools don't have them, um, and and so he's trying to teach them Python, and they're showing up with whatever they can get their hands on. And he's got 12, 13 year old kids showing up with their their mom's 12 or 13 year old laptop. Uh, it's got an external PS2 keyboard plugged in, plugged into the side because the, the keyboard and the laptop doesn't work anymore. Uh, and, and he said, this last time I went out was the first time so many of them could install Python on these Windows machines. Because typically they're locked down, they're restricted for, for, for um, you know, the parents' work, whatever they're doing, they don't have admin privileges, uh, there's just limits on what they can do, there's things that didn't work, uh, it's not all like simple five-letter ASCII usernames. Uh, and, and he said, the work that's gone into the installer has made it so these kids can actually use Python for the first time. And I was just like, that w was completely unplanned, but, but amazing. So, Yeah, those are some good stories. Rodrigo has a question. Lucas knows my name. OK, no, sorry. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, yeah. So the non non core developers are also humans, and we are much less experienced. So if we want to make our first contribution, how do we make it less likely to take too much of your time and more likely to be accepted? I think I can take this because I can, I, I review a lot of PRs these days as uh, as my job. Uh, so just fix something that is broken in the code that you're using. So like if you're like, have an idea to just proactively start contributing, and it's a very generic idea, but you don't know where to start, like start with something that you're already heavily using, and there's something wrong with it. Like there's much more likelihood of you understanding the context be behind the you know, some API then. There's a lot of changes where people wanna, want to change something just because they don't really understand how the API is constructed. So that, that, that takes a lot of time because we also don't want, don't, don't want them to just go away without their change being approved. We want them to know why. Uh, so that uh, takes a lot of time. 
Uh, we do appreciate even simple changes, like, you know, to the docs and whatever, like, you know, can if you find a typo, yeah, we'll accept it. But there's a lot of changes like these, and they're like relatively kind of low impact. Like if you read some docs and you know one word has flipped, you know vowels in it, you know it doesn't really matter that much. Um, so unless it's a part of a bigger change, like we tend to kind of avoid those fixes my, ourselves, which is why we don't fix every um, every typo ourselves. So yeah, like what I would do is just start at a place where you're already a, a user of it. So I don't know, like if you're working a lot with any files and you know you just don't like how config parser does something, like just go ahead and you know fix something about that. Like this is how I stored it. Um, like same with AsyncIO or whatever else. Like you know some part of Python that you're already using. Um, yeah, and and then just you know now it's easy. There's issues on GitHub, PRs are on GitHub, so just. Follow what everybody else is doing around you in the project, and you'll be fine. And it's also a terrible suggestion. I hate making it because it's a really mean thing to say to someone. But, but look up what other work and discussion has gone into the idea before. Most things have been discussed. And it's a horrible thing because it's really hard to find. And as a new contributor, you've got very little chance of actually being able to find it. But if you're able to do that, if you're able to kind of look through mailing list archives at mail.python.org, you can find links to the posts, anything that's on GitHub. We copied all of the old bug site onto GitHub, so it's all there. Uh, anything you can find, because we do have people will come in and say, I want to make this change. And it will take someone who's been around for 10 plus years to remember, oh, we discussed that before and decided against it for some reason, but we like that kind of research. But it is incredibly hard to do. So the, the more of that that you can know that you've done, the better. But you know, don't, don't spend too much time on it. Eventually, eventually declare, I couldn't find it. Here's, here's the idea anyway. Yeah, I, I wanted to add this, that whether you're joining the CPython team or a new team at work, you really want to spend some time and think, what do they need? What is it that they need? Don't come with an assumption that you know what people need, because it seems like a lot of people assume that what we need is more pull requests. And actually, what we really need is help reviewing pull requests. So, um, you know, like, once you realize that, I, the first thing to do is to spend maybe a couple of weeks just reviewing pull requests. And through that, it, high quality code reviews are a very quick way to get the right kind of attention in an open source project. It's very quick. It's quicker than producing good pull requests because then you're waiting for somebody else to do a high quality pull, uh, code review. Um, so if you could kind of review other people's PRs, um, kind of give the code devs a bit of information, like what, what, what did the person do, what's good about it, what's bad about it, kind of help the process along, you will learn about it because then you will see which ones eventually get merged, which ones don't, what kind of other feedback people get. So I would suggest to start contributing there. This is a good suggestion. Also, like, if you do create a pull request and it doesn't get reviewed, like, often it's like either nobody just looked at it among the other 50 that appeared that week, uh, or uh, it's actually not that obvious what we should be doing. So there's you know, some thinking that people are doing, maybe they should just respond on a pull request, they don't do, uh, do that every time. But you know, kind of, don't take it personally when your, your stuff is not expedited. Like, you know, like everybody uh, on the team also knows this, that, you know, that there's a small number of us and a lot of amount of change, so you know, not everything kind of happens quickly, but you do also don't want that. You don't want Python to change like too quickly. Uh, one thing I would add to the, you know, please review pull requests. Yes, please do that, but those reviews appear on GitHub as those like gray ticks. Uh, so if you do that, please review. So please write us what you did and what you found, right? Like if you just click, I reviewed it and I approve it, and it, you know, appears as a gray uh, tick, it's not really actionable to anybody. Like, you know, if you're a new contributor, like, we, we don't know, like, what you did. Like, whether you just stamped it without looking or you spent two days on it. So if you're reviewing, like, just put it on the uh, pull request. It's free. Like, you know, what did you do? What did you try? What did you find out? Yeah, we're, we're down to five minutes. But, like, we have uh, another, what, three questions? So 
if we if you're focused, we, we should be able to go through all of those. Um, maybe this is going to be a bad one for five minutes, but um, not non-technical questions. So my superficial understanding is being a core developer means you're working on C Python, and you have like push privileges and whatnot. But I feel like the Python kind of experience or the community is way more than just C Python. Right? There's all these very important things like pip, PyPI, I don't know, maybe Sphinx, like all these other things. Um, and I'm curious if uh, you guys have discussed promoting those projects as much as you, as much as, I don't know, you guys promote yourself or whoever else, whoever is promoting you. So like you guys get lots of FaceTime and panels like this, but I've never seen or know about the pip uh, developers, for example, or PyPI. Um, that's oh, okay, this is a great idea. Like, so w what I can tell you is, uh, like, we also didn't kind of promote ourselves with this panel. What happened is uh, just the organizers of EuroPython contacted me specifically, saying, like, hey, like, do you have an idea of like who could be in a panel? And then it turned out that by asking me, they just kind of implicitly asked me to to also be on the stage for this, like, to ask questions. Uh, so yeah, like, maybe it's a question for like kind of community organizers for event organizers to also reach out to uh, PyPA, so like the packaging authority uh, kind of maintainers. There's a, a, quite a bunch of them and whatnot. So uh, absolutely, we, 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 we are super inclusive. Like we like to just say like this, is, this community is huge, right? You have scientists that, you know, like uh, put telescopes uh, in space and that, then use Python for them. Like there's people in the medical community, there's teachers and whatnot, whatnot. What. We're, we're happy to like have all of them. Same with like Django, PyPA, and, and whatnot. Um, I don't. I don't think we should be really responsible for like whether they get like same amount of I don't know screen time like as we do. Like we have other panel sessions as well. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We like have there's diversity and also education panel. Okay. So there is an education panel. I'm hearing, and there is. Uh, a diversity one as well, uh, which is also something that apparently you can see it for yourself. Like we're not awesome at, but we're trying. We're trying to like improve the situation. Um, so yeah, it's a process. Okay. So, uh, so I was wondering how much freedom do you have in your core development work, and how much influence uh, does your company you work for uh, puts into you in terms of like your focus? Oh, that. That, that needs to be answered by somebody who works. But by, uh, a bit controversial. I, well, <laughs> yes. Steve, let's go. Um, I, I get a pretty serious amount of freedom, really. Um, and that, I think, has, has largely come down to uh, kind of Microsoft recognizing that we, you know, we, we have a platform to care about, we have a cloud to care about, and that's a place for developers to come and do their best work. And, 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 you know, certainly things have changed since I started doing this, because when I started doing this, it was, you know, from our point of view, Windows, Windows, Windows. And so anything that I touched that made the Windows experience for Python developer better meant that our platform was more attractive. Um, but, but at this point, because, you know, because Microsoft now cares cross-platform, it's like anything that makes CPython better makes that developer experience better. Um, and, and we're certainly not in any kind of position to, like, Keep that, like, keep that private. Like, we couldn't possibly do it. It just fundamentally wouldn't work. And so, so it, you know, the, they have very little influence. Uh, occasionally, I get some opportunities because I'm at Microsoft to do things. For example, um, if you look at the Windows Store right now, one of the kind of highlighted front page apps on the store is Python. Um, and that was an opportunity that came up because they could find me. And, and say, oh, you're internal, you work here, we can figure out how to promote this app and, and, and you know, just have this big Python logo in the App Store for everyone on Windows who looks at the App Store right now. And so I get some opportunities like that. Um, I can track down the Windows developers and say, hey, I found a bug that affects Python, can you fix it, please? Um, which is a great, you know, great that, I, that I love doing. Um, but, but they don't really, uh, like no one has ever really said, we, you know, we need this change added into Python in a way that, that, that I wasn't able to kind of push back and argue until it turned into a benefit for everyone. OK, thanks. How about Bloomberg? Right, uh, the finance boring world. I, I, I'm quite ha lucky. I've been working at Bloomberg for five years. And this past year, uh, I, I used to have 20% of my time to see Python. Uh, the, the way we arrived to that arrangement is because like, it was quite clear that the work that I was doing 
like was also benefiting developers inside the company, right? And although we have never, I have never received a prioritized bug that I needed to fix. It was like many of the things that I was doing on my own were already being like praised inside the company. So they say, okay, it, it makes sense to you know like put more effort. And this year actually I've been even more lucky because they like I'm working 50% of my time with the Faster C Python project, also part time with Microsoft, which sounds a bit weird uh, to say. Um, like Bloomberg is still paying my whole salary, but I don't know. It's quite a wild war. Um, um, so, so yeah, I'm quite quite happy that you know. But it's it's all about trust, and also there is some issues that people don't think about when you have this kind of arrangement because like, if, if you also want like, oh, I want a nice eval, right? But like now you have 50 percent of your time that is opaque to your managers. Mm -hmm. So because like, okay, yeah, yeah, you are having fun there, but like, what are you doing? How how is that really useful or more useful than if you do this other thing? So you need to have a a very good relationship not only with your company, so the higher ups allow it, but also you need that way to not sacrifice your career just because you're doing this. So you need to communicate and like make them understand and like be transparent. So it's a lot of trust involved, and that is normally gained through the years. Um, yeah, I, I could say exactly the same as uh, oh, what Pablo said. I used to work for Facebook, so like on day one, when you're being hired by Facebook, they say like, hey, don't don't get into bar fights. Like at least don't get into them anymore because now you're not like Wukash who got into a bar fight. You're a Facebook employee got into a bar fight. So if anything, the kind of the pressure that you get from working at a big corporation is that like you are now representing like a big corp that you know might get sued or whatever so you actually have to have more discipline that you would otherwise have like otherwise and there was never any pressure to do anything because it's all open source everybody else could see it if it happened all right uh, we reached our time pretty quickly in fact like i found it very interesting thanks all for coming i hope it was useful it was fun uh, now there's coffee break so you can wake up uh, yeah come to our talks Thank <laughs> you.